I'm a funky monkey. Welcome to my house of love! Now, the cinematic art form is primarily a visual medium, and nowhere was this made more abundantly clear than in our last episode, Doctor Strange. Of course, the computer-generated visual effects of Doctor Strange, and several other movies, are a relatively modern technology. Well, relatively modern. The first of these movies was Tron in 1982, but before that time, we relied on suspension of disbelief in our visual effects. All of which brings me to today's subject, an old school fantasy adventure set in Greek antiquity, Clash of the Titans. Released in 1981, Clash of the Titans retells the story of Perseus, the pre-Heraclean adventurer, and his quest to rescue his love from the clutches of an evil demigod. Featuring stop-motion creatures, animated by acclaimed stop-motion artist Ray Harryhausen, this movie made 41 million at the US box office, and still holds a 68% rating today on Rotten Tomatoes. So come with me, my friends, to ancient Greece to discover the legend of Perseus in Clash of the Titans. Zeus, Lord of Olympus, King of the Greek Pantheon, is not pleased that the King of Argos has abandoned his daughter to the sea. As punishment, he commands the release of the Kraken, last of the Titans. For you see, gentle viewer, the king of Argos was very proud of his beautiful daughter, Danai, but jealous enough to guard her behind an iron door. None of which stopped the king of the gods, Zeus himself, who visited Danai as a shower of gold. And then he knocked her up. Dude just couldn't keep it in his toga. As punishment for this supposed transgression, Danai was cast to the seas by her father along with the child she bore, our hero Perseus. But as Zeus himself commanded, Danai and her son Perseus, who is to be our hero, were saved and washed up on the Isle of Seraphos. And in time, the boy grows into a man. But Zeus is not so merciful against Calibos, son of Thetis. Ah yes, Calibos, son of Thetis. He had every advantage, and he squandered them. With cruelty and malice, he slaughtered the entire herd of Zeus's winged horses. All except the stallion Pegasus, who now is the sole survivor. For this crime, Zeus saw fit to disfigure Calibos, to turn him into a mockery of a man, to mould him into a demonic form, more in keeping with his inner nature. But Thetis won't take this lightly, and plans her revenge against Perseus, who awakes in the amphitheatre of Joppa, which predictably provokes Zeus's ire, and so Perseus is gifted armaments of the gods. Our hero sets out for the city of Joppa, where he learns of Andromeda and the curse of the riddle which inspires him to investigate further. Well, to follow a bird, one needs to fly. To this end, Perseus ropes him a flying steed. And the next night, our hero follows the bird to Calabos. Before the tragedies that befell Calabos, he was betrothed to the princess of Joppa. But then, equinocide, monstrizing, that whole deal. But his mother, the goddess Thetis, was having none of it, and decided that if her son couldn't have Andromeda, no one would. Thus, she set the curse of the riddle. Every potential suitor must answer a riddle, which changes for every potential suitor. And if they get it wrong, they die. Many have tried, none have succeeded. But oh dear, even invisible folk leave footprints in the sand. Long story short, 
Perseus wins. And with the hand of Calabos, he solves the riddle, and wins Andromeda's hand. And that's it, isn't it? Well, it would be, except for two things. Firstly, Calabos is still alive. He could always muster an army. And secondly, a little mistake at the wedding, at which Queen Cassiopeia presided. She declared that the Princess Andromeda was more beautiful than Thetis herself. In Thetis's own temple. Yeah, spot the deliberate mistake. Naturally, the goddess Thetis was not pleased with this, and declared that she would have Andromeda's life in tribute. Ah, <sighs> these Greek gods, man, I tell you. But our hero's having none of it, and seeks out three witches to find a solution. But without Pegasus, he'll need a guide, which is provided in the form of Bubo, the mechanical owl. And while these cannibalistic witches are somewhat tricksy, our hero is no fool. And the solution that our hero is looking for? Medusa, the Gorgon, or at least her head. Hell of an end to such a tragic story. And so, Perseus sets out to find Medusa, whose gaze petrifies. Perseus one-shots Medusa, and takes her head. But Calabos is still sore about his hand, and tries to take his revenge on our hero. Which goes about as well as you'd expect. And so passes Calabos, son of Thetis. Serves him right for being such a disagreeable so-and-so. Rot in the underworld. But shock! Pegasus lives! And it's all up to Bubo to rescue him. And they'd all better hurry, because the day of the tribute has come. But just when all looks lost, Perseus arrives, and gets knocked off his horse. And it falls to Bubo again to save the day. And so our movie ends with the successful wedding of Perseus and Andromeda, and our players immortalised in the skies above. So then, my friends, that was Clash of the Titans. And I just have to put this one into my house of love, if only for the legendary visual effects. This movie is slow! Or perhaps, to our modern sensibilities, we prefer our movies to be wall-to-wall -wall action, dialogue and effects. Either way, there's plenty to critique. But the performances, from such luminaries as Laurence Olivier, who really is the only person who could pull off Zeus, Maggie Smith and Claire Bloom, cannot be faulted. And of the mortals, Harry Hamlin, tousled and pouting, makes for a fine Perseus. Though Judy Bowker's Andromeda swings from confident princess to damsel in distress, and while Burgess Meredith is a likeable mentor, any humour he tries to bring is swiftly diffused. Because this is a very earnest movie. It has the sensibilities of an old school swashbuckling adventure, like Harryhausen's Sinbad movies of the 1970s. It's faintly ridiculous in how dead straight it's played, and of those effects, they are beautifully modelled, realistically rendered, and impressively composited, combining background matte, live action, and model animation in more than one scene. And that doesn't sound so difficult in today's digital drop-in editing tech, but back in the days of physical film, it was a much taller order, and it was pulled off here beautifully. The flow of the movie is akin to treacle to my modern eyes, and it could be said to be a film of two halves, as there is the first hour, where our hero is introduced, and the second, with the quest. And it really does drag, as there is little in the way of characterisation for our mortals, most of whom prove very mortal. And there is a touch of incidental nudity along the way, though this is brief. I think though that this movie can be seen as the end of an era, as in the following year, the early computer-generated imagery of Tron would take special effects to a new level. 
though it would take about 12 more years before they became anything resembling commonplace. And we may scoff, and our modern eyes may more easily see the join for the most part, but we forget at our peril that this was long the state of the art, and a craft of love that inspired so many. Spielberg, James Cameron, Peter Jackson, George Lucas, all of whom admit owing their love of genre cinema to Harryhausen. So yeah, as a film in itself, it's not that great. It's glacially paced, faintly ridiculous, and paradoxically cheap looking in places. But as a testament to stop motion effects work and the old school generation, it's beautiful. So thanks for watching. If you liked this video, why not consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell? And if you want to be extra awesome, check out my crowdfunding links in the description below. But for now, I've been Funky Monkey wishing you good days and great entertainment. So long, folks!